I get the great honor of uh, saying a few awesome things about B before we get going here. Um, so you're gonna have to put up with it for just mm -hmm. a couple minutes. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so a couple of things real quick that I think are great. Um, B is a 2007 award-winning graduate of Montserrat College of Art. And we're so excited to call her one of our own. But she also has her master's in fine arts and painting and printmaking from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, an awesome school in its own right. And she has been a visiting faculty member at Montserrat and our students are incredibly lucky to have that experience and several other colleges since her master's degree. She has been incredibly active exhibiting her work since 2007 and has been in a number of solo and group exhibitions in Boston, New York, Iceland, Georgia, New Hampshire, and Connecticut, to name a few. And she was, uh, has won several awards and grants, including a Fulbright Research Grant finalist in Iceland. Uh, we also, uh, she has also had residencies in Italy, Iceland, and New York. And quite frankly, she is a big deal. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, and I will say that uh, we are so grateful to have her here tonight. And one of my biggest highlights of my, and I'm in the third year of being president of Montserrat, is spending, I think, what was over an hour and a half with you in your studio in Queens, which I have to say is still a major highlight of mine since I got here. It was a privilege uh, to let, uh, for you to let me be in that space with you and to talk about your work. So with that, we hand it back over and away we go. Thanks, Kurt. <laughs> okay, I think... Um... I think I'm up. So, um, Kurt, that was so touching. Thank you. I have, I too have had the pleasure of knowing B um, since her undergrad days at Montserrat when I was an intern um, with the gallery back then. So it's wonderful to be here um, helping uh, facilitate this program. Um, and I have also the distinct pleasure of knowing Kaveri from our um, graduate school days in Chicago. So it's this wonderful sort of convergence of our communities. Um, so my name is Lydia Gordon. I am um, a recent Montserrat faculty. I'm an associate curator over at the Peabody Essex Museum. And my job uh, tonight is really just to moderate what I know will be a really beautiful exchange between these two um, prolific artists. So the format of tonight's program um, will be, I'll give a little verbal introductions, I'll add on to the amazing words that Kurt offered for uh, Beatrice. And then um, I've asked each artist to prepare um, some slides, some visual examples of their work so we can all um, get a little glimpse. Um, and then I will start the conversation with a question and we will go from there. So um, this program is an hour long. And um, we would like to invite the audience to submit questions via the chat box function at the bottom of the screen. Um, closer to the end of the program, um, I will sort of sift through the questions and, um, and ask the artists. Um, so again, we just really appreciate um, everyone being here tonight. And without further ado, um, Beatrice Modisset utilizes highly physical processes both in and out of the studio to explore geological phenomenon, personal histories, erosion as a means of creation and the systems humans create in an attempt to navigate, control and contain landscapes. Modisset earned her BFA in painting from Montserrat, her MFA in painting and printmaking from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. In 2020, she was nominated for a Rima Hort Mann Foundation Emerging Artist Grant and was named by Artsy's Alina Cohen as one of the 11 emerging artists redefining abstract painting. Beatrice was recently a resident at Wave Hill Winters Workspace in Bronx, New York until unfortunately COVID-19 required that she prematurely vacate her studio. Modisette was born in Washington, DC and currently lives and works um, in Queens, New York. Kaveri Reina lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. She was born and raised in New Delhi, India and moved to the United States at the, United States at the age of 11. She received her BFA 
from Maryland Institute College of Art in 2011 and her MFA in painting and drawing from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2016. And she studied at uh, the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in the summer of 2017. So now I will pass the mic over to Beatrice. Um, thank you both so much um, to both artists for introducing us visually uh, to your work. Great, thank you so much, Lydia. And Kurt, thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for making the time. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I do have, um, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I do have some notes that I'm going to refer to. So if I look down, uh, that's what I'm, I'm looking to, just so that I can keep myself on track and so that I don't forget anything. Um, for the last year, I've been working exclusively with dry media. I've been using uh, handmade charcoal, commercial charcoal, wood ash, and natural raw pigment to create drawings. But I want to contextualize the current work with some of the work that came before. Um, painting is still very central to my practice, um, but this year I've found drawing to be really, really fruitful. Um, what the paintings and drawings both offer when they're at their best is a spectrum of what I call visualized potential futures. I consider them kind of visual speculative fiction because they're based in my um, lived experience, uh, but they're kind of uh, paired with projections for the future based on our current trajectory. Uh, the images are informed by kind of my obsession with geological phenomena. I'm really interested in the processes that shape the landscape we exist in. Um, I'm interested in the big ones like volcanic eruptions, um, tsunamis, earthquakes, um, as well as the smaller, quieter things that are kind of omnipresent, but invisible. Uh, and all of these kind of forces, both big and small, are shaping our landscape that we move through. This is a detail of that last drawing or painting. Uh, the processes that I actually paint with also mirror these geological processes. I don't use brushes in the studio uh, and I prefer to pour thinned oil paint on the canvas. Um, I'll often, you know, tilt the canvas to kind of guide the paint. I'll put objects underneath the canvas to create mounds for it to either pour down or around. And I'll also often place rocks on top of the canvas to create valleys for the paint to kind of pool into. Um, there's a lot of, uh, embracing of gravity uh, involved in this process. There's a lot of chance involved. Um, there's a lot of anticipation. There's a lot of loss. Um, it's a very volatile process uh, to paint, you know, without brushes. I often will equate it to going on a hike because it's very strenuous, it's very physical, but it also opens up this, this space of you know, quiet contemplation um, that I really only find otherwise uh, on solitary walks or hikes. Um, so see, this is why I have my notes. Um, Lydia mentioned that I'm interested in erosion as a means of creation. I'm really interested in the, the, the line between when something is, is being created and when it is being destroyed. Very specifically, my first kind of experience with this was with Delicate Arch in Moab, Utah, which is this like incredible red rock formation that's being created and destroyed by wind and water simultaneously. Um, so it's both being created and destroyed at the same time. And I'm really interested in that, that tension. Um, working without brushes in the studio is exhilarating, but it's also kind of exhausting sometimes. Um, that lack of control uh, is, is, again, it's exciting, but um, it's stressful. So <laughs> for this recent body of work, I incorporated a new material. I started using uh, tar, which was a material that I could uh, kind of sculpt into forms from my own lexicon uh, and place those those sculpted forms next to the poured paint, which you can, oh, I don't have a pointer here, do I? No. So those sculpted forms are now being placed next to the poured forms. So there's like a, a, a greater tension between what I can control and what I can't control existing on the same surface. Those kind of raked um, 
lines through the tar are my fingers. Um, so it's still a very like tactile physical experience working with the tar. Uh, it also became a material in which I could embed objects. Uh, I mentioned the handmade charcoal and wood ash that I used to make the drawings. And I actually started embedding that in the painting. So you can see kind of in the upper uh, right middle, an area where I embedded pieces of charred wood as well as um, some wood ash. Uh, and those materials that were embedded in the painting uh, are the materials I used to make these drawings, which were hung across from these paintings at the Mayer Museum of Art in, in Virginia. Um, the drawings are still an incredibly physical process. They start on my studio floor and I'll sprinkle or dump uh, wood ash and remnants from the fires that I, I um, tended to make the charcoal onto the surface of the drawing. And then in a very like performative, physical, exhausting process, I will crawl across the surface, dragging my arms and my legs across it, um, indexing my reach in this charcoal and really embedding the material into the paper. So that becomes, that very like physical uh, exertion becomes the foundation of the drawings. Um, once that's complete, I lift it up onto the wall and then kind of start that more traditional dance of working on it and, and stepping back, adding to it, you know, and stepping back. These circles that you can kind of see, I wish I had a pointer to show you, um, but these kind of like circular vortexes that occur in the drawings are the, the, the reach of my arm. So my body and my um, physical capabilities are very much um, uh, recorded in these drawings and through working at this scale. Uh, and those, oh, okay. And so here in this detail, you can see handprints um, that have been preserved in the drawing. Often those like initial movements, um, which often result in handprints and footprints. And you can see like my cheek imprinted. A lot of times that will disappear with the, the added marks, but I'll often preserve areas that very um, plainly show handprints or kind of finger marks or, or um, palm prints. <laughs> so those, that's kind of the last you know, few years of work briefly that have led up to this installation at Montserrat, which I titled Feeding Sugar to the Stump. Uh, it's another monumental drawing. It's uh, incredibly dusty. Um, it's again, made of charcoal and wood ash on Fabriano paper. And for this drawing and for these other drawings, I've utilized multiple horizon lines, um, as well as perspectival, um, you know, like one point perspective in an attempt to create a space that is relatable. Um, my hope is that the drawing feels like a place that you could inhabit as a viewer. Um, and then what I like to do with that space is bring it to that precipice that I mentioned where it exists between creation and destruction. Is this place being created or is it falling apart? Um, and the viewer gets to bring kind of their, their own um, lived experience to that, um, that scenario as well. Um, so that's like a very brief introduction to, to where I'm at right now. Did I forget anything, Lydia? Um, I think that that was a wonderful uh, glimpse and I'm sure we'll um, keep digging and have to go back to some of the wonderful images you shared, so. Great, that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. And Kaveri, you are, you're, you're up. <laughs> Hi everyone. Uh, I'm just gonna really bad at this technology. Um, let's see. I'm gonna pull up some drawings uh, first and then I'm gonna do another screen share with some of the most recent paintings inspired from some of these drawings here. You 
guys can see this. Okay. Um, yeah, um, so I'm thankful that Beatrice uh, invited me uh, for this conversation and as part of her installation at the college. And as Lydia said before, um, her and I, we went to, we were at SAIC, where I went to graduate school. We went, we were at the same time there. And um, she's one of the curators for my exhibition for the MFA projects. And that's how, um, and then that was 2016. So we haven't, um, it's been a while since we have reconnected. So, um, but yeah, I'll start with some of the drawings here. Um, a little background about the drawings, I guess. Uh, so I, I'm not a drawer or I wasn't a drawer until summer of 2017 um, when a lot of, I was at a residency um, and uh, it was in Maine called Skowhegan. And um, one of the major like feedbacks that I had received from Skowhegan um, was from a lot of faculty members from seeing um, just other participants constantly draw. And I wasn't, I didn't, I wasn't into this thing where, you know, you have your sketchbook everywhere with you and you're constantly drawing each other or just while you're hanging out, you're drawing. And, um, and that's something that I learned um, at Skowhegan was this act of drawing constantly. Um, and uh, so yeah, after that's where it started. And some of these drawings started there they're 11 by 14 um, on paper with just graphite. And, you know, it's it's a very slow process for me. And I kind of call these image inventions um, where I'm constantly um, thinking of a particular memory or thinking of a particular instance and inventing these images um, just out of memory. Um, you know, I am sometimes looking at a lot of my past work or um, giving myself self questions like, what does it mean to hover? Uh, what does it mean to be suspended? What does it mean to be held? What does it mean to hold someone? And this was, this kind of started uh, right after Skowhegan. Um, I went to this other residency at Lighthouse Works, it was a six week residency where I took a lot of paper with me and, and graphite and that was it. And for the entire six weeks, I, you know, drew for like, uh, I think around 30 to 40 drawings that were like 11 by 14. And um, it's a very quiet and calm experience uh, just because there's only five residents and I, I could really think and kind of invent these images. And um, so yeah, those questions I would repeat to myself and kind of um, would come up with these images while I was thinking about them. Again, like sense, what is it like the sense of hovering is something that I think about a lot where you kind of, um, in this moment of lull, uh, it's not this or that it's kind of like, like in between, I guess. And, and that's what, this is what I was thinking at that time around 2017 at this residency and, you know, writing these questions over and over. Um, and coming up with these, um, I call these like characters or participants in these drawings where especially like, can you guys see my mouse thing? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So as you can see, there's this one character here and then this other character kind of holding this character, um, like this animal shape. Uh, and, you know, for me, this these two characters became really important. And once I like, like an image that I create, I kind of repeat it over and over. Um, it's this idea of being better than the previous mark, not knowing necessarily what better means, but this idea of um, progressing somewhere, like in transit to something. Um, so basically, you can see it here too. It's like basically those two characters repeated over and over. Um, the person being held and then the person holding. Um, but, and then here again, um, let's see. and then this one, um, it's, it's kind of more of like this, uh, this particular character comes again um, in a lot of the other, you know, paintings that I'll show. But I think of this character in particular, like as a, 
dark shadow wearing this like overcoat and then this dark cloud hovering. Um, you know, I, I think a lot about like, what does sense of doom mean? Uh, what does um, like the unknown mean? And then this cloud constantly uh, hovering over you, this cloud constantly there um, in, a, in like this moment of lull. Um, and these are feelings um, that I wanted to explore. And I, you know, since I was an 18 or 17 that I've, you know, um, and then here's like another, like a close up of a drawing where uh, I started like doing these circles, which happen in this one too, where it's constantly like, um, I'm circling around, but never really coming to a ground or never really coming to a decision. Um, it's this moment of uh, lull again, where I'm thinking, 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 questioning, questioning, questioning. Um, but the sense of knowing is never uh, achieved. Um, where, yeah, and I think there's that phrase, you know, like circling around, but never reaching to a destination. And um, and that's what I was, I guess, thinking with these circular um, marks that I was doing, um, you know, and drawing for me uh, became, of course, really, you know, I can only do it um, really small, one by 14 for some reason, and I have to have a table and, you know, and this quiet environment. So I'm kind of, very unlike painting for me which is I, I, you know really large and big and uh, more of a performative um, act whereas drawing is a very um, just sitting at a table more of a quiet meditative process and more detailed than my paintings as you'll see there's another one which is a little bit more um, gestural and then, so these were all 2018, which I look at. So in my studio, I'll have like, this is a shot of my studio, I guess, studio wall where I'll have drawings on one side of the wall and then I'll paint on the other side because I like to have them. I call them like my library of images. So I'm um, constantly looking at them while I'm painting. Um, so this is one of the most recent ones. Um, and they're becoming like the, they're becoming more, um, I guess less specific, if that makes sense. Uh, there's, so I'm using graphite stick. Um, so the freedom of really um, moving that stick around is really fun to me, <laughs> but also really therapeutic at the same time. Um, and especially like the, you know, doing the circles over and over. Um, oh yeah, here's some other ones. Um, also again, one by 14, so really is tiny. Um, I think I'm going to stop this and then share uh, the paintings. Um, so I currently have this show up at um, this gallery called M and B uh, in LA, and the drawings, the drawings were really uh, beneficial uh, while I was, so I was in Ohio for, so I live in Brooklyn, but I was in, I had to relocate to Ohio where my parents are for four and a half months. And um, I, I really, I just had a table upstairs and um, pieces of paper. And I was, uh, I did over 30 to 40 drawings and I was drawing every day and it became, you know, a practice where I was doing that every day. And, you know, it was the first time being able to draw or like make any kind of work around my parents, um, my niece, my sister, you know, the whole family <laughs> constantly around. And that was a very, very different experience than as I was saying at Lighthouse Works where I was by myself at the table looking at the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so a lot of this noise, a lot of, you know, the pandemic, of course, um, and everything, the outside world. Um, so it was a very different process, but that's where the, so I'll show some of the paintings done for the show, which, which started in March of this year, uh, 2020. And, but 
I credit like those drawings for four and a half months that I did because that's where the core of the thinking process um, started. But so a little bit of background about these paintings. So these are, um, this one is 60 by 48 and um, it's on burlap. So all my paintings are on burlap where I'm a little bit about the process. So I'm painting from the back and the front of the burlap. And um, I started that like end of grad school uh, where I was just painting from the back of the burlap and I kind of liked the idea of not knowing what I was painting from the, you know, what it would look like from the front. So the surprise element was really great. Um, and then I started painting from the front to, to kind of uh, have this like back and forth dialogue between the front and the back. And I kind of call them like a uh, slab of memories because I, I feel like there's layers upon layers upon layers and uh, burlap is not a forgiving material. It's, you know, it's very coarse. It's very challenging to paint on because I'm constantly fighting with it. It's really, really coarse and um, just has this like really, the texture is not pleasant. So I'm, while I'm painting, you know, the, the paint is, uh, it takes forever to dry and um, it takes up a lot of paint. So the material, yeah, it's, it's a challenging material, but still I really like the, the tactility that it provides me with. Um, so yeah, as you can see, a lot of the, um, the shapes are repeated from the drawings. Um, so yeah, and then the title's really important because I, I do write a lot and I read a lot. And this has started since 2018 where I'm, um, for example, like reading something and directly correlated to uh, what I'm thinking, I guess. Um, like right now I'm reading uh, these poems that Lorca wrote um, and, and that really, the words really helped me dictate my paintings. Um, so I came up with this title, DT, Hungry Heart, Seeing Ahead. And this kind of gave me uh, um, more of a idea of how I wanted to start the painting basically at the motivation. Um, so that was 60 by 48. Here's another one. Um, it's called, I thought it is, I think. Um, so these are like, you know, inner dialogues with myself constantly. Um, is it this or is it that? Um, I've been thinking a lot about shadows and shapes and um, the shape that I create, shape of my body. And then when, when it does, um, when I do see my shadow, like how, what shape that creates. Um, so, you know, I was thinking about that constantly while I was making these. Um, oh, that was, this one is 44 by 44. So squares are tough. This is like a small one. Um, here's another one that's 40 by 70. And I started working in this like longer scale because I kind of like the idea of them being uh, my size. And then so I, I am moving them around constantly. So that performative act kind of like I enjoy that they feel like a portal, feel a part of me. Um, this one's called lull choices made for me and and for me when i when i give these like writings to myself it really helps me to kind of ground in each painting i i base upon a particular memory or series of memories or memories that i've shared with someone or memories with um, people along the way or something uh, like that but it helps me ground start a painting and um so that's where like the titles come from too. Um, here's another one. This is solitary, solitary as when little, always unlearning, learning. Um, this is 44 by 60. And this is the first time where I'm also uh, using graphite on burlap with paint, which again, like it's not pleasant, um, especially like you can see like in this area where rubbing and rubbing, you know, the, what's it called the the graphite stick and um and it just doesn't get any darker than this so there's this like element of like constantly trying and trying so I, as you can see here this is the darkest I could get um and it's just yeah it's like kind of icky because whatever you touch it kind of like gets darker because of the graphite and just smudges but I really enjoy that, honestly. Um, it's a different sense of like pleasantness that I've been working with. Um, and I didn't do that before with the graphite. So I think I've been enjoying that even though it's more challenging to me. 
uh, that, that was 44 by 60. Uh, here's another one, limitless touch, hence I became, it's 60 by 48. Um, and Lydia, let me know, like I can stop whenever. So if, if I'm like- so Very, I don't wanna um, in, uh, interrupt you, but um, I do wanna pick up on something that um, both you and Beatrice have mentioned in your, mm -hmm. um, in your sharing and just to get you know the conversation going um yeah. i think seeing you know images of your drawings and your paintings is incredibly helpful it also spurs um this wonderful idea of your practices existing in this in-between space right so um for you kaveri you know um you know ligaments or bodies or the figure are, um, are probably there in essence. Um, and with Beatrice's work, um, you know, this landscape um, or this feeling, the spirit of the landscape, um, you know, it's not there in representational form, of course, um, but rather perhaps in some sort of synthesized fashion with abstraction. So I'm just wondering if you could um, talk about what that space is for you and why it's important that your work exists in the, in, uh, the in-between. Did you want to talk? Very, you want to take that or should I go first? Oh, I can, I can, I can, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I guess like literally it is for me, you know, starting painting on burlap, uh, 2015, I, you know, I am literally painting from the back and the front. And to me, like the sandwich of the, the both sides coming together was something that was really exciting. Um, and for me, you know, like, um, uh, I'm part of two different cultures and for, for me, it was, you know, bringing them together and, and then constantly struggling with this or that, this or that. And I, as I was mentioning with the circling to like, the indecisiveness, the unknowing, the the conflict of this or that is something that I try to bring uh, in the work. Um, whether you know, I have like these paint cans on the floor where I'm starting mostly, usually from the back, and uh, waiting for the paint to dry. So there's this element of. Uh, kind of like laborious like exhaustion, I think, where uh, this idea of like unexpectedness is there too, where I'm just sitting and not knowing how it would turn out and turning it around. So there's, I think there's constant like creating from both the worlds, both the worlds meaning both the sides um, for me. And yeah, that's all. That's great. Uh, Beatrice, same sort of question for you. And um, Kaveri, if you want to maybe stop sharing your screen yes. and, and I'll be um, uh, together again. But uh, B, for you, what is it about that, like that space between abstraction, representation, that in between? Um, why does your work exist there? Why is it that important to you? Yeah. So I mentioned to you when we were speaking yesterday that like incredible talk with Julie Moretto where she spoke about the potential of the blur where something recognizable is also slippery and, and how much um, opportunity that offers a viewer. Um, and so, hold on, I gotta pin you. I, I, I feel the same with my own work. If there's a space that is recognizable, it kind of forms this opportunity for there to be empathy with it, right? Where a viewer can see a space that's almost a place they could inhabit, or it's almost a place they've already visited, right? And so they, they form this connection with the space. And then if they can recognize that that landscape is in a state of potential collapse, right, or a, a state of um, potential creation, I guess, as well, uh, then my hope is that they can then apply that sense to other landscapes that they walk through, right? Like form a sense of empathy with the landscape or the cityscape or the humanscape that they're um, encountering 
and recognize moments when it may be going through um, an act of creation or destruction. I think, um, you know, after um, getting to know both of your work and, and being really excited um, to be here tonight, it made very clear that there um, were sort of more opportunities or more entryways um, into your work through this in between language, of course, of abstraction um, and representation. And both of you, well, you've said this to me, I don't know, I, I think you've said it to the group here, but I wanna get you talking a little bit about memory. I mean, it seems that both of you are, um, are working from your own personal memories of walking through a landscape or being somewhere physical and having, um, you know, having an experience or perhaps, you know, an interpersonal relationship. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how memory sort of enters your, uh, your making? Yeah, I'm interested too, because Kaveri, you mentioned that like each drawing you reference a memory and I'd love to hear if like each drawing addresses an individual specific memory. Because for me, the way I utilize it is that I conflate multiple memories, multiple places, multiple perspectives, like multiple times into one landscape. So it then becomes, you know, this kind of, um, like collage of memories rather than addressing just just a single memory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, I think each painting I write first and in that writing process, uh, I think of a particular memory or an instance or something that is worth uh, putting it on the burlap and, you know, and taking it to taking it further. So yeah, it, it's a mix of everything. Uh, sometimes it's a particular person. Sometimes it's a very, very vivid dream. Sometimes it's a very, very, uh, um, yeah, sometimes it's particular, sometimes it's not, it varies. Um, but for me, again, like putting it down into language somehow has really helped me, uh, clarify the past uh you know it's this idea of yesterday and tomorrow for me it's and uh memories from yesterday you know every, like all memories are past um something that like lingers something that just like stays with you but what makes it really concrete for me may not be for the audience right um, and that's where I guess like the abstraction representation comes into where for me, it could be an apple, but for you, it could be a ball for me, it could be a lemon for you. It could be something else. So, uh, I like that idea of the memory being specific for me, but shifting it for the viewer. Mm -hmm. And I don't like the idea of like forcing my memory you know, it, I like the ambiguity or, or like the open-endedness of each image or shape. Um, yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I, it's so amazing, like the longer and longer, you know, I work in a studio, the more and more I learn about the work. And I grew up, I mean, I was, I was born in Washington DC, right? Which is, the land of like paved sidewalks and really imposing architecture and, um, you know, some parks. And I grew up, you know, in DC, but I also grew up in Rhode Island, which is, you know, the riptides and like, you know, waves and cliffs and the rugged coast. And I, I realized, you know, in recent years that both of those lived experiences had been in the work for so long. Like, these systems of architecture and sidewalks existing next to like the crazy weather events of New England um, had been, they'd been conflated on the, the, the drawings for a long time before I was even able to put words to it to describe that that's what was happening. But do you have photos that you look at? Like how do you like references? 
yeah, I take, I used to consider photography like my drawing, like when I travel all the time, like I'm constantly taking photos, um, right. like potentially annoyingly. So when I'm around other people, but it's how I document when I see something that, that, that stands out to me and maybe I can't articulate it at the time, but I take note of it and I document it with my phone um, as opposed to taking out a sketchbook and drawing it. Like right. never, I never do that either. Um, and then those photographs make their way into the studio, right? And I will often hang them, but I often also just like leaf through them at the beginning of the day, I'll go into the studio and like remind myself of um, a specific place. Recently it's been, um, Diamond Beach in Iceland. Like I'll look at photos that I took while I was there and then, you know, reabsorb those images and re like invigorate those memories and then start to draw. Yeah, I think color works like that for me. Um, like color from like familiarity with the color, um, color from the past or color from, uh, you know, growing up in India, just like having tons of um, uh, just bright colors around constantly, whether it's in clothing, whether it's with cooking and constantly, I think being around that. So I think color through memory is something that I think about too, is how does that fade um, or does it fade? Like what sticks with you and um, what doesn't? Um, because color is such a huge part of painting for me. Um, There's also such like moments yeah. of like exaggeration in memory where things are like exacerbated or like um, made bigger maybe than the actual event. And then there's also right. some like, loss where you can forget things. Um, well, it's like this idea of like being like, I'm in my studio by myself. It's me, my paintings and this large window I'm lucky to have. Um, <laughs> to look out of. Uh, so it's just, it's, it's just like me me paintings and this view. And so I think like everything that I'm, I'm constantly thinking and thinking and perhaps overthinking. So I think, and then they, they become into these snippets or, or these like, yeah, these memories and then, you know, writing them down. So, so everything does become out of proportion <laughs> yeah. uh, or because I, you know, I'm thinking about it constantly over and over. I think the solitude uh, of a, artist is like it's 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 real it's like um being by yourself for eight hours nine hours daily uh you know I'm a maker so I go to, try to go to my studio every day and have that practice um and and then trying to remember me certain memories uh you know or like dreams it's it's very um and then how do you remember it's like lost in translation is another right. thing <laughs> right and that's like another sense that's of another layer <laughs> Yeah, that's like another sense of solitude is like you're alone in the studio working, but then you also are having these like images in your head or thoughts and it's like, how do you communicate those? And of course, like, I guess that's what the paintings and the drawings are. That's an, an attempt to communicate something that only you hold, right, in your head. Right. Um, yeah, and I think this year more so than any other years has been just talking to myself, like, as I said, like the inner dialogues more so just because it's, um yeah it's 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 just me um you know of course like you have people to call and like friends and family uh but, but like the core of the work the core of the time is spent alone and not talking like you know even the work that is up it's didn't talk to that many people about it um yeah. and then now it's like part of the world yeah uh, the audience how they receive it uh is very different usually than how I plan it <laughs> and that's okay. Can we talk a little bit about this moment? I saw um, Ginger put something in the, the chat box, you know, like isolation is real. I mean, we're all <laughs> experiencing it, uh, you know, differently, but this, this concept that you both are talking about, about like distilling memories or information and putting forth in your painting. I mean, is this um, a time of great productivity for you both? Or are you uh, wrestling um, with so much alone time? Are you finding any sort of, you know, escape through your making? Um, did you, oh, yeah, uh, I think 
so I, as I said, I'm a maker, so I'm constantly making in my studio. But this year, uh, while I was in Ohio, I uh, didn't as much. So the level of producing um, was much, much less. And, you know, even with the show coming up, um, but I was thankful, you know, to have that table and to be able to draw. <laughs> uh, and it wasn't like my normal, you know, four and a half, four and a half months is a long time for me to not. Um, so yeah, so I think like productivity, but you know, in the end, I, I'm necessarily not concerned with, I say this now, but I, I think I actually mean it, uh, that uh, uh, what the painting looks like is, I wouldn't say irrelevant because that's not true, but I think the process and the, the thinking and the time spent thinking and actually making is much, much, much more fruitful to me than uh, what it comes out to be. So I think productivity for me was done in different, different ways. Like whether it was reading, whether it was listening to podcasts, whether it was chatting with my dad or, um, you know, so I think I, can, I came to those terms that like, it, it's not about this like rectangle paint, you know, that I have to do to show. Uh, it's like snippets of things that build up. Um, and yeah, and as I said, yeah, I got to writing and reading. And I think that was also really part of the whole process. I had a very like similar experience. I think the most productive thing I've done is redefine what productivity means because um, <laughs> I used to, I've always um, gotten up and gotten out of bed and like drink coffee, go to the studio and then stay there until I can't be there anymore. Right. And I thought that that type of work ethic was what would um, kind of advance the work forward. And COVID forced me to not do that. And I was reminded of how important reading is to me and how important cooking is and, you know, going on walks. Like I was running um, through the graveyard because it was, there was no one there. Um, and remembering that those things are productive. And by doing those things, my time in the studio becomes much more focused and much more about being there and in the studio, even if it's only for you know, six hours instead of 12. It's the like quality of time in there has become so much more um, important as opposed to the, the duration. Um, right. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. Like, I'm so thankful, like my reading practice has strengthened so much um, during quarantine and it's, it's helped the work. Yeah, me too. And I'm a slow, slow reader. Yeah, same. <laughs> Very slow. <laughs> I'll read one line maybe 10 times <laughs> to like figure out what it's saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, believe it or not, we have 10 minutes left. Okay. So um, I'm going to just look through um, this chat box and just communicate some of these extraordinary questions um, from our audience. Um, Oh, Barbara O'Brien. Oh my gosh. Um, sorry, mentor of mine, a former Montserrat gallery director as well. Um, so Barbara is uh, asking Kaveri a question. Um, she says, Kaveri's drawings have a gestural vocabulary and formal quality that seems to connect to the work of Susan Rothenberg also an artist synthesizing abstraction representation. So um, she asks, have you considered working on a much larger scale um, in this figurative vein? Um, yes, I, uh, uh, drawings have not become larger than 11 by 14 somehow. Um, I think that's really important for me to sit at a table um, and draw. <laughs> and uh, I have tried working really big with drawings, it has not worked, uh, but maybe that's a challenge that is worth exploring. Um, but with my paintings, uh, I have, uh, I think the largest one that I did this past month 
was like 80 by 60. Um, so, so yeah, I, somehow I'm able to like paint larger, but I'm not able to draw larger. And that's something I need to figure out uh, why that is. Um, but as I said, I think the drawing is, is very much um, like jotting down ideas or jotting down specific memories. And for me, yeah, being able to like work small and then making that larger in a painting is, um, but yeah, that's something that I need to explore, I guess. Um, and I guess it'll just come in time. <laughs> well, scale is so interesting, right? And you're both working. Um, yeah, with... they're like body. Yeah. With totally. portals. Yeah. Um, Beatrice, have you um, played with scale at all? I mean, you're, you know, monumental is uh, is the name of the game for your for your works as of late. Have you um, have you thought about varying scale or what that does? And I mean, your practice is so performative. I just. Yeah, I actually, because the making a large work is so physically draining, I do have a practice where I sit at a desk um, to draw. And I, I'm currently making, I think they're like 20 by 36 inch drawings. Um, and I, I make a lot of them. I make one in like three hours as opposed to three weeks, right? Um, which allows me to work through ideas really quickly. It allows me to not worry about the outcome at all because I've got a huge stack of paper and it's you know not a huge investment of time. So I'm able to, um, I don't wanna say experiment more because the large ones are always an experiment, but they allow me to just work quickly at that scale. And for me, what happens is even though the, the um, the object itself is smaller, it almost feels like a zoomed out version of the larger drawings. It's like it's the, the large drawings are maybe like one acre or like so of a plot of land and the smaller drawings show 50 acres. Um, so there's this interesting like shift in scale that happens um, when actually working smaller. That's really amazing. Like, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's really amazing. I mean, being um, able to sort of take that step back while being, you know, constrained or confined or just working in this different mode, I think is, um, I mean, it's, it's really, you know, adaptive too, I think also to, you know, these sort of current conditions that um, we're in. But there's this one question in the chat box that um, is, just such, has such an optimistic tone. I just want to end on it because my God, we need some like, we need some good vibes, right? Um, so there is a question about what is um, your dream project? So for both of you, um, if you could do anything with your work or have your work shown anywhere or do any sort of um, program um, with a certain, you know, particular crowd, um, what would be most um, meaningful to you right now? What do you, what do you like yearning to do? Who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I, I the first, <laughs> the first thing that came to mind. Um, and this is, I think, very indicative of the time. I would love to work with a group of artists who have a lot of the same ideas, are concerned with the same issues, um, you know, climate change, a lack of intimacy with our landscape, um, a lack of understanding or connection um, to place. I would love to work with a set of artists who have the same concerns and endeavors, but have completely different approaches or completely different skill sets. And whether that means we, you know, collaborate on a, an object or a show, or it just means that our work is now in conversation with each other, um, that is what I'm craving right now. A, a, like a, yeah, cohort, a context of, of like-minded artists who approach it from, from different perspectives. 
I can think of a really amazing group show right now because <laughs> Do it. I mean, climate action is, um, you know, it's something that uh, is on, you know, the top of the priority list and the top of the consciousness. I mean, you and I have been texting back and forth like this whole week about the New York Times articles yeah. coming out, the social life of trees, all these publications. I mean, there's so much, um, research and journalism um, that is being produced around, uh, you know, humans and our relationship to uh, us trying to control uh, yes. nature. Yes, um, right. And it needs to be a reciprocation. It, we, you know, of course there are major exceptions, but it, it's, it seems as if, um, we, a lot of, I, it's so hard to speak generally because there are so many exceptions, but so many humans treat the landscape as a thing to extract from, to take from, right? Which I think is, you know, that's fine. Like the land, the earth has a lot to offer, but it needs to be this like reciprocal relationship. And that's, I feel what's missing is the give back, like the return. Um, that feels really harmful. It is harmful. I mean, we're, we're seeing that. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Kaveri, what are you, um, what are you burning to do? Um, I guess what I was thinking was, uh, as I was speaking today, you know, I've, language, as I said, has been important, uh, but it's always been um, my words or um, my like dialogues and our dialogues and I think something that Beatrice mentioned yesterday actually got me thinking um you know so for this exhibition a friend of mine Pedram like wrote the text for it and it I guess something that I would want to do that would uh be challenging would be that like perhaps some some sort of like collaboration with uh a writer um or someone who writes a lot doesn't like necessarily have to be a writer writer um and see like how the words someone else's words trigger um uh, like some sort of um what the process or what the outcome comes from is like some sort of collaboration i guess between the person who writes and me who's a visual artist um since all the writings have been titles have been mine um but yeah that's what i was thinking yesterday and um and then also just to like work being able to work much larger um sorry i didn't complete that sentence. uh work yes but also just work uh, you know like i just having the means to have like a large studio of course um to explore the idea of working I don't know, like 80 by 80 or like 90 by 90 or something like that. And I think the scale is so important. Um, so somehow to have like a larger space to work with um, also, I guess. Yeah. So yeah, I, I guess these two things, um, since language has become such a huge part. Um, yeah. And you have, um... I'm gonna plug your show that just opened in LA because there's this beautiful essay or, or poetry, if you will, that um, accompany, you know, there's this text that accompanies um, your paintings. And I think it adds, um, you know, this idea that there's this voice almost um, sort of ruminating in the space or giving some sort of context, even if it's a virtual viewing, um, you know, adds this layer of meaning, which I think is quite um, generous of you also as a visual artist to sort of be vulnerable and be um, able to sort of open up um, uh, your practice to this outsider with words, um, which of course language is full of, um, you know, problems and, <laughs> and, and different types of meaning. But um, I think that that, that, um, that pairing, um, is uh, incredibly strong. Right, and I think it's like, how do you make the words, because you know, the words are so specific and direct. Um, and how do you, uh, like in undergrad, I was reading like the metaphysics by Aristotle and it's like two volumes and I was somehow just obsessed. And- Wow, good for word per 
<laughs> word word per word, you know, I was like almost had it memorized and like my favorite line still is like to perceive is to suffer or something like that. Mm. And it's like I was obsessed with like <laughs> putting that you know, having that as like a background to the work to the paintings and but it becomes challenging too is like you know the words are so direct how do you it becomes really literal and I think I was just driving myself crazy I enjoyed reading these philosophical texts and then turning them into um, paintings and it's almost like it's impossible in a way um, but I love that experience so yeah so I think um language in general can be tricky yet I think can bring out like fruitful moments um but yeah I think like Pedram did a really excellent job of um you know making the text really personal yet uh snippets of memory uh where and the viewer can also relate to a little bit of it um there are some lines like tears from yesterday like there's like um just build up uh memories and residues that I think it's, it's nice to kind of read while you're looking at them. I think that's that's one of my goals is to like be able to do that more um, in the future. Um, pairings, I guess. Wonderful. Well, you both have offered um, this group so much tonight. We have so much to think about. We are so inspired. Um, thank you, uh, Beatrice and Kaveri and Montserrat College of Art for um, organizing this amazing conversation. Thank you to all of you uh, for joining us and for um, asking your brilliant questions and stay well, stay uh, inspired. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice and Lydia. <laughs> <laughs>